On the 17th of August, 1966, the only prototype to have flown of Britain's most advanced aircraft project was towed down this road. It flew just 24 times, and the 200 million pounds that had been spent on its research and development was eventually to be reduced to just 50,000 pounds worth of scrap. This is an aircraft graveyard at Shoebury Ness in Essex, where once proud aeroplanes are used as targets to test the effects of gunfire and shrapnel. Such was the fate of TSR-2. What remains today of the TSR-2 project can only be found in museums, standing as testimony to the decisions that sealed its fate. Conceived in the 1950s, designed and flown in the early 60s, the story of TSR-2 is one of technological triumph and human endeavor. It was an aircraft years ahead of its time. From 1950 to 1957 could be described as the post-war golden age of the British aircraft industry. Shop floors were full of priority orders, resulting from the Korean War panic. Design offices were working flat out on a whole series of advanced operational requirements for the RAF and the Navy. The Farnborough air shows revealed a procession of advanced prototypes and piloted scale models of shapes to come. Then, in 1957, the Secretary of State for Defense, Duncan Sands, presented his defense white paper to Parliament, which called for the elimination of manned aircraft in favor of missile systems. This left Britain's aircraft industry and the Royal Air Force with just one key project to pursue, the replacement of the highly successful and widely exported Canberra bomber. On the sort of aircraft we were looking at, we'd already looked at the idea of a specialized low-level bomber, and that was canceled in early 56, I think for quite good reasons, as it was, such a narrow role for an aircraft. And we felt we still uh, should go for low level, because we saw it as the only means of penetrating Soviet air defenses. But equally, we wanted it to be able to put on a reasonable performance at altitude. And I'm talking anyway between 40 and 60,000 feet. Um, I say that because we visualized air-operated um, engines, ordinary uh, uh, turbojets, in other words. We weren't thinking of things like ramjets or anything. And we, we called it uh, um, a tactical strike reconnaissance aircraft, hoping that that would convey the um, uh, idea of our operational technique. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy had not been idle in identifying its requirement for a low-flying strike aircraft. In 1955, Blackburn Aircraft won the contract to develop the NA-39 Buccaneer, a twin-seat carrier-borne strike aircraft capable of flying under the enemy's surface vessel radar screen. The Navy had a powerful ally in Lord Louis Mountbatten, who, as Chief of the Defence Staff and a lifelong naval officer, 
tried to persuade the RAF to opt for a modified version of the Buccaneer as the Canberra replacement. Whilst this would have helped to reduce the costs for the Navy and ultimately the Air Force, the RAF felt that the Buccaneer would not fulfill their requirements. Now, the, the Buccaneer was an extraordinarily successful airplane. Um, it was built for mainly for low-level work. Um, and, but the point was that the RAF didn't think it was, at that stage, was fast enough or good enough high up. There was nothing wrong with the Buccaneer. And contrary to the popular belief, and you may be very interested to hear this, that uh, in 1956, I asked Barry Late, who was then the chief designer of Blackburn's, um, if he would very kindly produce a brochure for me on the NA-39 for the Royal Air Force. And he did that, and we did consider it. It was very seriously considered. Uh, Mountbatten used to rather lie about that and say we never took any interests, but it was very seriously considered by the Air Force. Now, I think the real tragedy is that uh, the Tories should have had the sense to develop the Buccaneer into a strike reconnaissance aircraft for the Air Force, but the Air Force wouldn't agree to that. And Varel Begg later told me that he thought that the decision to go for the TSR-2 was, in a sense, compensation to the Air Force for the government's decision to give the nuclear deterrent to the Navy. And Varel Begg was head of the Navy. By March 1957, the RAF began to circulate its basic requirement under the title General Operational Requirement 339. The industry were to report back with designs and comments by January 1958. But in September 1957, the government dropped another bombshell on the industry. At Chelmex House, the permanent secretary at the Ministry of Supply called a meeting of the heads of all the major aircraft companies and told them that following the 57 defense white paper, there was no certainty of further aircraft projects except GOR 339. He also told them that proposals would only be accepted from those firms who were prepared to collaborate together on the project. The government had effectively aimed a pistol at the industry's head. The message was amalgamate or die. The companies spent hundreds of thousands of man hours developing their concepts. Amongst them, Vickers Armstrong, who came up with a single and twin-engine version of their Type 571, which was to be based on the new concept of a fully integrated airframe, engine, equipment and weapons system. English Electric was the only British company to have built an operational supersonic aircraft in the Lightning. They proposed their P-17 provided with a VTOL capability by the P-17D from Shorts, who'd been gaining valuable experience in vertical takeoff with their SC-1. The P-17 con concept was a very, very good one. And if you look at the, um, uh, the general arrangement drawings of it, um, superimposed on a picture of the TSR-2, you'll find that uh, outwardly there was very little difference. The P-17 was to ride piggyback on the P-17D to give it a full vertical takeoff capability. The P-17D, which was powered by no fewer than 70 engines, was to enable the P-17 to take off and land back on the platform in the air. English Electric had got the measure of the supersonic bomber aspect absolutely right, but the, their solution to providing the short field takeoff and landing capability with this lifting platform, um, I think would have been immensely difficult to do, very costly, and I had some doubts as to its practicability. I, I didn't think it would work. 